Hi, I'm Corey Alderdice, Director of the Arkansas School for Mathematics, Sciences, and the Arts, and welcome to part one of a three-part series on finding a narrative and choosing a path. This lecture is normally done as a discussion as part of ASMSA's Composition 2 unit. Um, in the spring semester, we turn our attention for high school juniors to the college admissions and selection process. And each year I have the chance to visit with our students about what this process actually looks like. In the past, I've had the opportunity to serve as an admissions officer at a selective institution like ASMSA, and I know what it's like on the other side of the decision matrix in which we're trying to review hundreds if not thousands of students for consideration to top-tier programs and institutions. And that can be a very challenging and trying and anxious uh, experience for students. So the series is intended to help demystify parts of that process and help students set a path while building their narrative for success. In this first part, we're going to talk about a changing college landscape. Over the last couple of years, there have been a couple of seismic activities that I think parents and students alike need to be aware of uh, and how those factors play into both the decision-making process for families as well as for admissions officers. Last year about this time, probably the, the biggest discussion on the national landscape was about a college admissions cheating scandal. A variety of wealthy, influential, and even famous families had been caught in a federal sting raid um, in which they were bending, if not route Right, not outright breaking the rules of um, college selection. Uh, what it did highlight is that an, a winner-take-all and high-stakes aspect of college admissions. Uh, a lot of the times folks think that if you can't get into Harvard or Princeton or Stanford or MIT that your life will absolutely be over. And so as families undertake the selection process, sometimes they'll do just about anything in order to get the outcome that, that they desire. Perhaps the second part that was particularly important about how this scandal unfolded and as further details came to light, uh, it was ways that the system, especially in regard to standardized testing on things like the SAT and the ACT, uh, were being manipulated. Uh, many of these parents were seeking uh, 504 waivers, special accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act that would allow their students to have additional testing time or, or other access to resources. And and these accommodations, when appropriate, are perfectly legal and ought to be in place for, for students who need those things the most. But these families were manipulating the system uh, to, to make that available. Again, you can have a look at these further articles that are on the screen to provide a little additional insight on what's going on. In the last several months, though, as uh, recent as last December or December 2019, for those tuning in later, uh, the National Association for College Admissions Counseling settled with the Justice Department, the federal government, uh, regarding part of their code of ethics. Historically, there's been what you can call an informal agreement between institutions on two major points. Uh, first is that institutions will not actively recruit away current students. So, well, imagine that you're uh, a first-year undergraduate student at State College and the, the liberal arts independent university um, down the road says, hey, you know, we'd love to offer you a, a tuition discount in order to come here sophomore year onward and, and to graduate. That, that's been informally considered a, a no-no among professional admissions colleagues. Um, again, that's, that's no more. It certainly does create more of a, let's say, free market atmosphere on how institutions can and will recruit students going forward. I think the other important piece, and this is especially noticeable for students that are beginning the college selection process now, is that historically institutions haven't been able to incentivize uh, early binding decisions. So for example, um, a university can't offer you a better dormitory or better student housing if you choose to apply binding decision by the November 1st deadline. And again, with the settlement with the federal government, um, that practice is no more. 
And even in the last few weeks, we've begun to see universities offer a apply by this date and will knock $1,000 off your tuition. So in the way that right now we're seeing car dealerships offer 0% interest for 84 months and 90 days deferred payment, we may very well soon see more universities embracing this mindset. And as the college admissions landscape becomes more challenging, as state funding in some cases decrease, that does put additional pressure on admissions officers to deliver. So be on the lookout for changes on that over the next several months, particularly as we go into fall 2020. <clears throat> As you begin thinking about your college decisions, I think the most important thing to, to keep in mind is that this decision is not just about college. Uh, it's about thinking about your life ahead and what you want to achieve, what you want to do, and ultimately, who do you want to be? As I said before, this process can be filled with stress and anxiety. That's not okay in and of itself, but it's okay to feel that way throughout the process. And so I think the best way to potentially adapt to that is how you treat the process itself. How can we make this a constructive exercise in your own personal growth uh, and developing your sense of identity? This should give you a chance to reflect on who you are, what you want to accomplish, uh, and not just as it pertains to college. It's got to be more meaningful than just picking a school and a place where you'll spend the next few years. Um, here's a list of the top 10 dream schools that have been identified by both students and parents. Now, one of the challenges of doing this session digitally is that uh, often involves students and a lot of question and responses on it. So I want you to take a second and look through each of these two lists and see what commonalities you might find. These are all fairly name brand institutions. If you were to ask a random group of individuals, name a prominent college or university in the United States, and guess what? Most of these lists, uh, most of these schools would show up probably somewhere in this list, especially if we were doing this family feud style. Think for a second about what commonalities you see on the uh, list itself. Again, a lot of Ivy League institutions. Um, and a lot uh, of top-tier research institutions. For the students, are there any noticeable traits that you might happen to identify on that list? I think one that normally jumps to attention pretty quickly are the locations uh, of institutions. Uh, we have California, uh, New York, um, the Northeast, um, and these are, you know, these are, are popular urban areas in the United States with a lot of opportunities, not just for university study, but also for life and cultural enrichment. On the parent side, what do you notice as well? I think one of the things that jumps out most often on the parents list is that it is much more Ivy League driven. Uh, the decisions are also based heavily on a lot of career prospects. So with University of Pennsylvania, you have the, the prestigious Wharton School of Business, and, and families know that's a, that's a great way to, to get into a career. You also have the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, which is a prominent medical school, engineering program, uh, and, and lots of other great opportunities. What stands out to me the most on the student list as well, uh, again, is that sense of geography. A lot of California schools, and not just Stanford, which happens to top both lists, uh, but also UCLA, as well as Cal Berkeley, and USC at the, the bottom of that, that top 10 list as well. I think the other question that we typically ask students is, why do you believe that Stanford appears as the top choice on both lists? Take a second to think about that, because it is odd on such a diverse list of schools that one university would be front and center for both students and parents alike. And I think it boils down to that Venn diagram. It is a prestigious institution. It is at the leadership of top global rankings. It is in the very heart of Silicon Valley, uh, which is not only an economic development center, but a cultural center. Uh, as well. It has everything that all sides of the discussion are looking for. Great location, 
great programs, and a great opportunity in college and beyond. But here's the thing. These are fewer than 20 of the more than about 4,000 schools nationwide that are available to students. And these are easy choices to think of. They're all great programs. But as you begin to think about your college selection process, you've got to go deeper than just what's available on the surface. As families also begin to undertake this process, probably one of the biggest questions that comes up is how many colleges should I actually apply to? And about 40% of respondents to a survey noted their child would apply to five to eight colleges, and about 30% would apply to nine or more colleges. That's a lot, I and mean, that's a lot of paperwork and processes. Now, things like the Common App and other systems have made it much, much easier for students to cast a wide net. Even ASMSA's own uh, resource, uh, which is Naviance, plugs into both Common App as well as a host of other online systems that do alleviate some of the burden in that process. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise that students and parents both want to explore a variety of different options. As you break down a traditional college application list, you're also thinking of safe choices, schools that are appropriate based on your overall um, ACT, SAT, GPA, and and enrichment profile, and then what we would typically call REACH schools. And a lot of those REACH schools, because of their selectivity, are the schools that we talked about on the, the previous list. As families begin this process as well, there really are four parts that are inherently stressful to young people and, and parents alike. 35% noted that completing the application process for admission as well as financial aid is top of mind. 32% said test scores like ACT, SAT, as well as AP exams. 24% said waiting. And really, in some respects, it's surprising this number is not higher because waiting for things to happen, things being out of your own control, those are the parts of the process that really do tend to create anxiety among young people because no matter what amount of work you put into it, sooner or later, the decision's out of your hands. And 9% said researching colleges, sorting through that list of hundreds if not thousands of institutions that are immediately available at your fingertips. For ASMSA students, the, the test prep portion of this is um, probably one of the, the less important components of it. Uh, students have taken this exam on several occasions. They know what the form and function of the test looks like. And most of the stress that comes along with that is trying to get that magic score, that perfect number that makes them a competitive applicant. And those vary by institution. For ASMSA students as well, an ACT composite of 32 is also uh, often a, an important number because that's the score by which students qualify for the governor's distinguished scholarship. And if you're staying in state, in Arkansas to continue your undergraduate education. That's the difference of about uh, $25,000 uh, between around $14,000, $15,000 with a regular academic challenge scholarship or $40,000 with the Governor's Distinguished Award. The other piece uh, I want to go back to briefly is about completing that application process and the financial aid component. Uh, applications themselves for selection, essays, all of that's a fairly straightforward process. You can do that paint by numbers. Where most students and families by proxy tend to struggle the most is with the financial aid process. Now the FAFSA deadline has moved up. It's not dependent now on your current uh, tax return for the year. You can use the previous year's tax return so you don't have to add another stressor into uh, the early part of, of the year. More importantly, though, we are seeing uh, a shift in, in additional financial aid tools and resources uh, that are also available, particularly the CSS profile, which is a, a product of the College Board, our friendly makers of Advanced Placement and the SAT. Now, that resource drills a little more specifically into nuances of uh, your family's financial aid ability, and more and more selective institutions are utilizing that to have a complete picture uh, of what families can reasonably pay. 
Uh, there's a, a notable uh, college admissions blogger who's a dean at a community college in the, the Northeast, and uh, in January of last year, he, he wrote about undertaking uh, the completion of the CSS profile. This is a person who works in higher ed. This is a person who writes about higher ed weekly. This is a person who is deeply committed as a professional and a scholar of higher education, and even the CSS profile was a fairly daunting process for him. So you can naturally imagine the anxiety that most families have when they're tackling that document as well. For ASMSA students, we're happy to offer our student success coordinators who are, are getting more and more confident each year with navigating students through that process. Uh, last year we had an increase of students that uh, attended out-of-state institutions uh, and were quite good about putting together uh, competitive financial aid packages that made some of these institutions even more in reach than public colleges and universities in Arkansas. And a faculty member at our meeting in August said, what do you think made the difference on it? And in truth, it wasn't that the senior class last year was stronger or, or better or even more aspirational than their peers. First, they leveraged these documents which helped colleges make informed decisions and informed offers. Um, and second, they followed through. Much of this is a negotiation and simply being able to and being willing to persist through offers and counter offers with help from SSCs and others is incredibly important. So again, there are a lot of parts that are tough. There are a lot of parts that are stressful. And I think one of the topics we'll continue to revisit is leverage the resources and particularly the people that are available to you to guide you through this process. One of the other things that's important as we think about the, the sheer number of applications and also when colleges herald the selectivity of their incoming class, uh, particularly when schools are below 10% or even now some getting closer and closer to below 5%, uh, is that these systems like the Common Application and other online resources do make it incredibly easy for students to apply and colleges to accept those application fees. So remember, it is a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think too, as you look to settle in on the number of applications you intend to submit, that's one of the important things to keep in mind. You can apply to dozens and dozens of colleges, but those may have 40, 50, $60 application fees, let alone with test score fees uh, added on top of those in some occasions. So at the end of the day, you may have to pick an upward ceiling on that. Biggest college worries as well for families is ultimately the cost of college. 85% estimated that their college expenses would total more than $50,000. Of that cohort, 41% estimated more than $100,000. That's a lot. And the biggest worry for families is obviously debt. The average Arkansan who's graduated with an undergraduate degree these days carries about $25,000 in debt. And one of the major university leaders in the state, when he addresses members of the legislature about the growing college debt crisis, and remember, we're talking around a trillion dollars nationally in debt, and college debt is not easy. It's almost impossible to, to get rid of. If you declare bankruptcy, you, know, you can have a house repossessed or a car taken away. You can't really take away a college degree. And so that, that's why the debt crisis is probably one of the biggest looming threats for um, particularly uh, late millennials as well as now Gen Z. But when this college leader in the state talks about that average $25,000 debt for uh, Arkansan undergraduates, uh, you know, he notes that it's not a lot for some young people to think about going to a car dealership and spending $25,000 on a pickup truck. And at the end of the day, an education is a investment, a lifelong investment. And if it's a smart investment, certainly it can pay dividends. There's plenty of research that notes individuals who possess uh, an undergraduate degree over the, their lifetime of, of professional earnings will out-earn peers um, who only have a high school diploma. So there are tangible benefits there, but it doesn't mean that you ought not to be a smart consumer um, and to carefully reflect on the kind of debt that you may take on when you do make your choice about a college. 
So that wraps up part one. Uh, in our second discussion, we'll look more specifically about how you craft your narrative and what goes into building a competitive narrative. Feel free to contact me by email or via social media, as well as connect with the Arkansas School for Mathematics, Sciences, and the Arts. 